Um, that was funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hand it over to Tracy, who is our search specialist at Adoption Network Cleveland, and she will be introducing Brienne and taking it from here. Hi, before we get started, I just want to go over some some of the several things that we have coming up. Our Monday evening speaker series is going strong and we have outstanding presentations coming up. June 7th, we have uh, Damon, Dave, Damon Davis. He's the um, founder of the podcast, Who Am I Really? And June 14th, Ann Fassler will be here speaking about the legacy of the girls who went away. Then we have a break and we'll be back in September. And as we schedule for the fall, if you have speakers that you'd like to see, please email Betsy, um, or you could suggest in chat as well. You could send her a chat. In addition to that, on Monday, May 31st, we will have our discussion group for the um, TV show, This Is Us. And yes, that is Memorial Day, but we know uh, the fi series finale is tomorrow. So uh, probably lots of good things to talk about after that. And we don't wanna make you wait. We have lots of other programs, including our virtual general discussion meetings six times each month. And you can see our calendar and that link will be posted tonight as well. All of our speakers in this series are generously volunteering their time and we thank them for participating. And now I have the pleasure of introducing Brian Kirkpatrick, who will be speaking on DNA family search and reunion viewed through a bioethic lens. Brian, is, Brian Kirkpatrick is a licensed and certified genetic counselor, consultant and author of the books, The DNA Guide for Adoptees and Could the T DNA Test Be Wrong? Through her private practice and online support group, Watershed DNA, Brian offers support and professional guidance with a focus on adoptees, donor conceived persons, and people with unexpected family matches. She's the founder and owner of Watershed DNA. And now I'm going to turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you so much for that introduction, Tracy. I appreciate it. And also to you, Betsy, I think you guys offer a wonderful service with these Monday night speaker series. I know the pandemic kind of threw everybody for a loop and that you were able to find a way to continue the education through an online format is um, really commendable. So thank you so much for making that available. I've watched some of your recordings of prior week's speakers and learned from them as well. I'm gonna start off with disclosures. I'm founder and owner of Watershed DNA. I do not have any current relationships with commercial laboratories, organizations, or institutions, but I have been a consultant for 23andMe and my heritage in the past. And I wanted to start off with a little bit of my um, background and how I became interested in genetic genealogy, family genealogy, and working with people who are affected by adoption, donor conception, and not parent expected discoveries. This is my paternal grandmother, Wanda Lou. And um, when Wanda was four years old, her mother died of complications related to the birth of her younger sister. And she and her sister were given to their maternal grandparents to be raised and their father left and uh, never was a part of their life again. And this is something that deeply affected my grandmother, even when she was 80 years old, she could still tell me memories of um, being four years old and the last time that she saw her father. And I, uh, near the end of her life, I became interested in family history, not just for the family we knew about, but also for the family we didn't know about. So um, could there be branches of our family tree through this great grandfather that we didn't even know existed? Are there medical conditions that are running in the family that we don't even know about because we don't have family medical history on that side of the tree? So these kinds of questions um, were in my mind and uh, we ended up exploring DNA testing in my family and found um, multiple people in the family that we didn't know were connected in our family tree. We also uh, were connected with a half brother of my grandmother who 
had not even been aware that he had half sisters until after his father had passed. And so through um, personal interest led me to work with people who as a search angel. So I actually spent some time um, doing search angel work for adoptees and, and NPEs that were searching for a biological family. And through these experiences, I began having other gen genealogists reach out to me with questions that they thought that my background as a genetic counselor, I may, might be able to assist with. So questions around ethical situations that people were in, questions around medical discoveries that were being made. And it seemed a really natural fit for my professional background as a genetic counselor and the interest and the experience that I had developed from being a part of of the family search and reunion world myself. So that's the that's how I came to be where I am. I think it always helps to have a little bit of a sense of someone's uh, backstory to uh, understand the lens that that they view the world. And so the all of the work that I do, I'm viewing viewing the the situation through my own personal lens. And tonight I wanted to present on a particular kind of lens that some um, people view the world, and that's the lens of ethics and bioethics and biomedical ethics. So tonight I'm gonna be talking, I'm doing a little bit of a basic introduction into you know, ethics, what, what does that mean? And if you haven't pulled out a little piece of paper and pen yet, I encourage you to do that because there's six terms that we're going to discuss tonight that are gonna come up uh, a couple of times, and I'm even going to ask you to kind of apply your own bioethics lens to some cases that I will talk through later on in the talk. Um, so pull out your pen and pencil if you haven't yet. Um, we at the end we will do some participation and questions and questions from the audience, and I hope that um, if there are questions about the particular terms that we're going to be discussing tonight that you feel comfortable to ask because if you're having a question, somebody else in the group is as well. And um, I'm happy to kind of go back and, and try to reframe or rephrase a description if something's not very clear. So ethics and morals, these are, are two different things. So what ethics are is, um, I get into the definition on this slide here. So ethics are, moral principles that govern a person's behavior. So ethics is really focused on behaviors and choices based on beliefs of what is right or wrong. And these can be based on the community or the time period in which we're, we're growing up and living. It can be um, based on the family in which we're raised, the culture in which we're raised. And some of it is just personal, um, you know, even within a family, people view the world from their own lens. And so there's um, ethics is kind of what you make of it. Specifically, um, bioethics and biomedical ethics are applying ethics to specific areas. So um, bioethics came about in the 19, let me find that slide, in the 1960s and 70s. When people started to notice that maybe you know doctor knows best, but is that really true? It's when medical paternalism, so the idea that you never question the doctor, um, that people began to doubt that. And so discussions started to arise at decisions that were being made in the medical field at every level. You know, who gets what, who decides, who really does know best. So this is. The, the, the specific field of bioethics and biomedical ethics is relatively young, but the terminology used in this area is not young. So the biomedical ethics focuses on four principles, and these are four of the six terms that we're going to be talking about tonight. First one is autonomy. Second one is beneficence. Third one is non-maleficence. And the fourth one is justice. I'm going to define what that means in a little bit. My training as a genetic counselor came from this book, an earlier version of this book, but it's the Principles of Biomedical Ethics by Bisham and Childress. 
And this is the lens that I um, approach DNA testing. And it's the same core principles, but different ways of applying it and describing what those four principles mean. So let me show you this chart here, because it also includes those four terms, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. And we've tossed in two other ones. One of them is truthfulness, and the other one is confidentiality. And I specifically pulled these ones out because when we're looking at the area of family search and reunion, and we're thinking of the different decisions that are involved by all of the different people involved in a family search and reunion, we tend to see truthfulness and confidentiality come up along with these other four principles. So um, in, in my own work as a family searcher and then search angel and then with particular clients who have who had kind of neat extra special needs in their searches, these, um, these were coming up and by putting a name to what was happening, for me, it helped me understand uh, what might be happening and to communicate. So it's, it's a way of adding words and language around uh, situations that are not black and white. And all of these, when you put a name or words to what's going on and you're improving communication, that's kind of the basis of helping get needs met. So let's explore each one of these terms in a little bit more detail. So justice is the idea that everyone has a right to know their origins when we're in the basis of when we're looking through the lens of bioethics in specifically the family search and reunion setting. And another way to think about that is fairness and equity for each and every person. The next term is autonomy. And autonomy is the idea that individuals have a right to, their, to make decisions for themselves. So my life, my choices, the right to choose for oneself without any coercion or pressure from others. The third one is confidentiality, and this goes along with privacy. And I'll explain the difference between these two terms. The difference between confidentiality and privacy comes back to the difference between who's holding the information. So confidentiality is when somebody else knows my information, but they do not share it beyond themselves. So if you think about going to the doctor's office and you have the HIPAA form that you sign, they're, they're guaranteeing you confidentiality. Privacy is when you hold the information yourself and it's your right to decide who knows that information about yourself. So confidentiality and privacy go together. They're just slightly different because it's who's, who, who's holding the information. So um, a way to think about this is when somebody says, it's my right to choose what people know about me or what people know about my life or about my history. And another way to think of this is not relaying news or information out of turn. The next one is beneficence. And this has this, comes from the same root word as benefit. So that's what helps me remember, you know, beneficence, it's benefit. So do, the good, do a good thing for someone because it's the right thing to do. So this is the idea that we act in a way or behave in a way that's benefiting others. And then uh, this, the fifth one, non-maleficence. This one's the hardest, hardest one to spell, I think. Um, so I'll give you some time to write this one down. Non-maleficence. This is the idea that you avoid causing harm if you can, or acting in a way to minimize harm the Hippocratic Oath that doctors take a pledge to when they graduate from medical school 
is kind of non-maleficence at its, at its prime. Um, and then the last one is truthfulness. And this is actually um, a form of autonomy. So both truthfulness and confidentiality are forms of autonomy. But we se I, I separate them out and talk about them individually because, um, because they, the, they are spoken about as kind of being separate from other types of autonomy in family situations. So truthfulness is don't lie, tell the truth, just the concept around telling the objective truth. So everybody is already an ethicist and you, you're an ethicist and you don't even know it. So there's not really um, any right or wrong answer here when, I, when I'm you know, going to be asking, asking you, you know, what's going on in this situation. You have an intuition. And everybody intu intuitively weighs pr these principles in their lives anytime they're making a decision. So I was going to stop a moment and ask people to write in the chat box, what are a few reasons, what's a reason you can think of that it might help to talk about ethics in this area of, of family search or a family reunion? Let me find the chat box. So Tracy, I can't see the chat box while I have my uh, presentation open. So if you see anything coming through the chat, would you be able to speak it for me? Yes, I will do that. <laughs> yeah. So I'll ask the question again. So um, why are we, why does it matter to talk about ethics? when we're talking about family searches and reunion? What would be a benefit of, of bringing ethics into the discussions? It's new territory that not everyone has had the chance to think through thoroughly. Exactly. Finding out through DNA versus traditional ways of genealogical research. It's important to be prepared for various situations and feelings on all sides of the family, parents, children, et cetera. Exactly, those are all great points. And they all come back to the idea that everyone has needs and we need to communicate clearly and well about them in order for needs to be met. And when it's new territory, you know, this isn't an area where ethics has, ethics comes up all of the time, but we don't really have the language around it yet. We're still working on the on the language that's going to help us understand what's going on and understand each other. Exactly. So thank you to those of you who left a comment in the box today. Let me shrink that chat box. So this is um, especially important to those working in the area of advocacy. If you are um, an advocate, part of an advocacy group, I think it would be really great to get solid on ethics and these terms in particular, because at the level of policymaking, these are the types of um, terms that come up. This is like the language of policy and law and, and decision making. So this can uh, be the start, but maybe not the end of ethics training for you. So I'm gonna go talk through a couple of case examples and these are um, based on, on lives, of, you know, people that I have spoken with, but none of them are identifying or actually you know, specific to, to anybody. So this is, we'll, we'll say case example one is Roberto. Roberto's in his mid seventies. And he has known he was adopted from childhood and has not searched for biological family yet. He was recently widowed after his wife died with uh, breast cancer after a battle of five years. They had two children together who are both married and uh, three grandchildren total. And his son asked Roberto um, over dinner one night, asked him about DNA testing. And he said, have you ever thought about finding out more about your birth parents, dad? And Roberto answered back, yes, he had thought about it, but it just never felt like the right time. 
when their kids were younger, they were busy raising their family. And he, Roberto made a comment that I never wanted to hurt your grandma and grandpa and make them feel like they weren't my mom and dad. And then when I retired and your mom got sick, it just was never important right then. It was never the most important thing. And now I don't know what might happen if I do search. Maybe I won't find anything. And what if I find out something I don't really want to know? And, and what if I find out my birth parents are still alive? And what if I find out that they're not? Maybe it's better to not know at this point of my life. So this is the um, just one case example of where there are a couple of different themes that come out that we could describe, we could characterize them underneath some of these different ethical terms. So um, I'm going to do a little bit. As anyone who was listening, as I as I read through this case with Roberto, when you heard the description of "I never wanted to hurt your grandma and grandpa and make them feel like they weren't my mom and dad," if we look at these six principles, and I'll go back a slide so that you remember what the choices are. If you look at these six principles, which one does that fall under? Autonomy. So autonomy is another a possibility. Autonomy does come up in this case for sure. In this particular part of the scenario, non-maleficence is kind of what this ties back to, that um, Roberto wasn't wanting to cause hurt for the parents who raised him. So that can kind of be attributed to non-maleficence. Where autonomy comes in is that Roberto had thought about it and had decided maybe, you know, not actively, but passively, you know, he had decided for himself that he wasn't going to search yet. Um, and, and so the idea that um, Roberto's deciding for himself for his own reasons and not because someone else is deciding for him, that is autonomy right there. So excellent, thank you to the, to the two commenters. You both were spot on with this one. And really there's not a right or a wrong answer. So don't be afraid to you know, put a comment in the comment box. We'll go to the next case now. And um, this case is of 10 year old John. So John is at home watching TV one night, sitting on the couch next to his mom. Um, and he sees a commercial about DNA testing and he turns to his mom and asks, do you think that would work on me? John is a transracially adopted child and he was in the foster care system in Renee's family before being formally adopted by her, Renee's his mother. And Renee maintains occasional contact with John's birth mother in an open adoption. And John has met his older half siblings a few times in person. There has been no information shared about John's biological father. And Renee has thought about DNA testing on John due to concerns about some health issues he was having that haven't yet been explained by the doctors or any testing. But she has hesitation about submitting a DNA sample to a commercial lab, especially for a child who's 10 years old. So John's question on the couch makes her think again about that option for DNA testing, makes her think whether it's time to reach out again to John's birth mother just to broach the conversation and uh, makes her think, you know, what, what's the right answer to tell John right now? So this, this example pulls in um, a factor that the prior case did not pull in. And the major difference is age. And I am curious for some comments, when is age a factor and when is it not? In the case of the law, the age of 18 is when a child becomes a, an adult under the law. And in situations of um, adoption, donor conception, not parent expected discoveries, 
what are some thoughts on um, how to approach age when thinking about the right, what something, something that might be considered the right thing or the wrong thing to do? Here's another way to ask it. If, if John were 18 years old, would you feel differently about him asking the question of his mother and what her answer should be or could be to John? Thank you, Jamie. So Jamie believes everyone should know their truth regardless of age. Agreed, Cassandra. So principles in flux in this particular case, what that means is um, ethical principles are not set in stone. They are always shifting based on the, um, the particular timing. There are, um, when does a decision become a child's decision to make versus the parents, especially when it comes to, you know, how do you interpret privacy or confidentiality? And um, what is the difference between beneficence? Um, you know, who, who, is, who is the beneficence for and the non-maleficence for? So some great conversation in the chat that I think would be a, a great um, topic to bring up during the Q&A at the end, which is um, you know, age, differences in age, and whether it matters if that is even a factor when it comes to discussing ethics. So the last case example is of Carol, who is a birth mother, who receives a long-awaited letter in the mail. Carol's husband and her three young adult children have always known that Carol had placed a baby girl for adoption during college. After an unintended pregnancy with a friend who was aware of the pregnancy and agreed on the choice of adoption for the child they conceived. One day, 35 years later, a, le a certified letter arrived in the mail at Carol's house. Carol had given a letter to the social worker for her daughter at the time that she placed her for adoption and made sure all of her information in the registries she was aware of said open to contact. She had been considering DNA testing, but decided to wait a little longer to be found. When asked about it, her explanation was that she didn't want to intervene into the adoptive family or cause a surprise if her daughter was not planning to look for her and the DNA test caused things to get complicated for her daughter. So I'm gonna go back to the chart and um, I want the audience, the listeners, um, any, anyone who wants to pick a particular part of the story involving Carol, and we'll talk about which of the ethical principles surrounds that particular choice point. So as an example, um, if we think about Carol's decision to not do DNA testing, what could be a driving ethical principle be behind that decision to not do DNA testing yet? So we have a commenter that's, that is stating she wants to give her daughter an, uh, autonomy. Mm -hmm. Another commenter is confidentiality. We have a couple people saying that. Yes, exactly. So, um, and what what everyone has picked up on is that it's both, it's both autonomy and confidentiality. And many of the ethical principles work in tandem together where they're not really seen to be in conflict. Um, they can, they're almost, um, you know, they're parallel instead of opposing. So confidentiality, exactly, autonomy, 
and maybe a little bit of non-maleficence too, that maybe she was deciding um, not to take an action because it might have a harmful outcome, even though there was not really any evidence to suggest that. But from her decision, from Carol's point of perspective, making a decision about DNA testing brought up different things for her that were outweighing any beneficence that she might have felt at that point in time. Excellent. So um, what if Carol had decided to submit DNA testing or what if she hadn't, but one of her children had? How does this case exemplify the autonomy of one person in conflict with the autonomy of another person? And another question related to that is, is there a conflict? I think maybe a conflict occurs if if the birth mom and the birth daughter or the birth mom and the daughter she raised felt differently about this, then there would be a conflict if one of them wanted to find the adoptee and the other didn't. But in this case, they're both open to it, it sounds like. Great point. So it can also be situation and like case and family specific. So in um, one situation, if they, um, there may be a conflict between the autonomy of two people, but you can't necessarily know that ahead of time. And I think that's where things can get really challenging is um, not being able to predict the future or see, know what the other side, the experience or the lens of the other party, the other side is, and having to make decisions without all of the information that maybe if you had all of the information, your decision would be made differently. It's an excellent point. So we haven't talked about justice yet, um, but actually uh, justice did come up in the comments a lot when we were talking about John and who's the 10 year old John who asked about doing DNA testing. Now, in that case, John didn't ask specifically about relationships or about people, he was asking about the DNA testing. So we don't know for sure if he's curious about his ethnicity or ancestral background. We don't know if it is the family matching or family finding feature of DNA testing that he'd be interested in, or if it's something with the, the particular commercial he had, um, if you remember, or if you saw some of the 23andMe commercials a couple of years ago, were uh, selling the idea that you could find out who you are through DNA. And we can't be inside John's mind to know how he interprets that. So we're not really sure, you know, is this, what exactly is um, John's motivation for asking? And that's where um, you know, the conversations and opening up the, the discussion around um, what the search is for and the piece that DNA testing plays into that search. Uh, but many of you who I, I saw in the comments were talking about that age isn't a factor. Uh, made the point that, let me scroll up here, everyone should know their truth regardless of age. And that exactly falls under the ethical principle of justice. So as we um, get to the end of the formal presentation about the ethical principles that are guiding decisions around family search and reunion, I wanted to comment one more time that um, advocacy groups, people interested in advocacy work, 
getting solid on ethics terminology can really help you in your work because this comes back to needs communication and um, getting clear about you know when there is a conflict what exactly is the conflict about and is it really a conflict or can two ethical principles be working in tandem or side by side and for people who are facing difficulties in a family search or reunion understanding uh, what might be going on from a different viewpoint can help you in trying to not only like communicate your own needs and figure out you know what what your decision um, find confidence in your own decision making because you were able to identify exactly what ethical principles are guiding you in your decision making so um, before we switch to q a i wanted to point out some of the resources that I think would be helpful for those that want to continue on the path of learning a little bit about bioethics and how it applies to family search and reunion. So the Hastings Center is a think. Oh, let me go back. There we go. The Hastings Center is a think tank or research group that has a lot of um, different bioethicists that focus on um, human ethics, medical ethics, and uh, lots of great research and writings on ethics coming out of their center. There is a program on PBS called Secrets in Our DNA. It's a NOVA series. And I thought that show is a really great uh, overview of ethical situations that arise in the world of DNA testing in our day and age right now. The resource list of the Coalition for Genetic Truth is a very rich resource and um, Coalition for Genetic Truth has a Facebook page, Facebook group. And um, I know some of the attendees here on the, on the call today are also part of the Coalition for Genetic Truth. It includes a list of podcasts, websites, organizations, Facebook support groups, non-Facebook support groups and the like. Some of the advocacy and education groups that are great resources include the Right to Know, CUB, ANC, has a DNA support group specifically for um, talking through DNA discovery situations, and AKA also has a DNA support group, which I just learned about tonight. I run Watershed DNA, and it's a uh, a full spectrum resource. So I have a blog with um, four years of blog posts related to medical topics, family search, um, ethics, and everything related to consumer DNA testing and how it is impacting people's lives. And also there are um, free resources. I have a page with a link to my book, The DNA Guide for Adoptees and do individual consults for DNA search and discovery. And something to know that's coming in the future, there's a bioethicist by the name of Betty Cohn, and she is focused on bioethics research on family discoveries and consumer DNA testing. And she and I are working on a, a paper on this, on this topic that I'm presenting on tonight. So that's just something to take note of and look for in the future. So thank you. I'm going to turn off my share screen so I can see everybody's faces while we have a conversation for the rest of the evening. Okay, so thank you so much, Brianne. That was a great presentation and a wonderful way of looking at some of these very complex and complicated issues that surround making contact with, with birth relatives and, and going through the process of search and reunion. So if anyone has questions, comments, um, please let us know, reach out and chat. One thing that occurred to me um, about the one case with the 10 year old, I felt like there was in addition, in addition to justice, truthfulness really was an important topic there. Um, and I think that that was really 
that really resonated with folks in the chat as well. Good point. And another question is um, when, as she was thinking of, um, you know, reaching out and making contact with John's birth mother, what, which of the principles might that fall under? And I could see a couple of different ones that that could fall under actually. Yeah. Um, I see Dee has a question. Dee, do you want to pop it in chat? And then we also had a question um, that came through um, when, uh, when people registered mm -hmm. about, are you committed to making sure that you are providing accurate information and advice to people who visit your site and listen to your podcast? And, podcast and what steps do you or will you take if a resource you are promoting or guest gives false hosts gives false, misleading or harmful information? It's a very good question. So um, I am a part of the Coalition for Genetic Truth and have been from the beginning. That's a really, um, because of just the personal experience and seeing how um, the difficulty my grandmother had with not being able to communicate about her family background really stayed with her lifelong I realized how important it is to be able to talk about really difficult things and slow down and listen so that's something that I prioritize as being the the founder the person in charge of watershed DNA as I slow down and I listen to the feedback that I get. And I try to, when I hear of different perspectives, and because um, I'm thinking this particular comment might be related to a recent podcast episode in which a wife of a discovered bio father was um, the guest and talked about her experience and some of the things that she had learned and had put in a guide for other families. And as I consider what perspectives to share um, through my blog or through the podcast, what I am trying to accomplish is a way to um, talk about difficult situations that show up in a way that helps improve understanding on all different sides. And sometimes I do that well, and sometimes I need to, you know, listen to the feedback that I get and um, make a change. So after that podcast, I had, um, there was a lot of reactions to it because it was a perspective that's not really shared often. And it was a perspective of one person. And how do you you know, represent an entire perspective with one person, you really can't. So I listened to the feedback that I was receiving from that and um, made changes to the blog post and, and that was written about the episode and things like that. So I am committed to doing the best that I can to listen and to um, use the platform that I have, that I've, I've worked really hard to um, create that is a safe space for as many people. That's great, thank you. And I think that that perspective of a spouse is, is definitely one that we don't hear enough. And it's very powerful because it can really impact how a relationship can or might not progress and, and if it's even sustainable. So that's a powerful perspective. Okay, so we have um, another, some other questions coming in. Um, somebody wants to know about uh, the accuracy of Ancestry and 23andMe 
as paternity tests. Yes. So um, when people are asking for paternity confirmation, my first question is, what are your goals? Because if it is um, confirming an initial DNA test, I um, will want to know was, did that initial DNA test, was it a parent-child match or are you making assumptions about a parent based on a different relationship, like a sibling match or an aunt-niece match? So I would not use, there are certain situations I would use ancestry testing um, as paternity testing, but um, the reasons that it cannot be a substitute is um, there's something called chain of custody. Chain of custody is when a sample is, um, when you know for sure that the DNA that was submitted to a laboratory came from the person who's, who says it's them. So um, if it's for legal proceedings, an ancestry test is not up to snuff because there is no legal chain of custody to make sure that there wasn't um, you know, sample swap along the way. A second reason um, a DNA test or a paternity test can actually give the wrong result is if the father had an identical, or the mother had an identical twin and it will report an aunt as a mother or an uncle as a father if the situation is of identical twinning. And then the third situation is in cases of a stem cell transplant. And there have been situations of ancestry testing matching a stem cell recipient. So they've, they've received the stem cells of a donor and when they do the DNA testing, it matches them to the donor's family instead of their own family. So there are some really rare circumstances in which the ancestry test can be wrong, but those same situations could also throw off paternity testing. Did I answer the question or did I? Well, um, she's wondering, should you get a paternity test to confirm the ancestry or 23andMe test? And I guess, the, you know, a clarification would be, what have you matched to? Do you have that parent-child match? Have you spoken with that parent? Are they saying they are your parent? Um, in those cases, we yeah, right. don't need another test. Never, and so, right. right. I, if, there is, if there's anybody who's doubting the initial DNA test, my recommendation is go ahead and have a second test just to check off that box of there is no doubt. And some people do need that second test of there is no doubt to be able to accept and move on to the next steps. Or even if the other person has doubt, go ahead, they, they should have what they need to feel comfortable too. I always tell people. Exactly. And I've, I've seen enough situations of the wrong brother, like the wrong brother being identified as the dad. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So if there is a brother involved, a second test is always um, helpful. That right. removes any doubt. Okay. And then let's see. What are the ethics with regards to siblings or half siblings who are connected to the adoptee through DNA? Um, with regards to privacy, if they are still processing everything or still in shock from the news or revelation? Really good question. And more than an ethics question, is that's more of a, um, an adjustment to shock and processing of trauma question, I feel like. But I will pull up, let me go back to, I don't have my screen shared anymore. But if I were to think of the ethical principles, so is the, the question is, if a sibling, if you've matched to a full or a half sibling that didn't know about you before, right. and they're having a hard time accepting that you exist and that you are in fact their full or half sibling. Or you might even be the one who, is found and you're not ready. 
Mm -hmm. So at that, at that stage, um, the ethic in, so the ethics guide the decision making. Mm -hmm. So if the decision making is do I continue to reach out, whether it's via text or message or um, letter, like do you make the decision to continue contact? That would come back to um, it could be justified by justice and truthfulness, a search for truth and a search for fairness and equity, so being treated with equity. And um, making the decision to wait would come back to non-maleficence or making a, a decision that you're going to minimize harm in the short term. But then that's where things come into flux because tomorrow is a new day and things may be completely different tomorrow than they are today. Okay, and we have another question. Um, what about when the theory birth father has already passed on and you can't get a DNA or paternity test? How do you prove that somebody prove or disprove that someone is the birth father? In some cases, there never will be DNA evidence of the connection. It comes back to circumstantial evidence and, and a removal of all other possibilities. Mm -hmm. There are ways to get DNA samples on people who have already passed and there's um, a kind of testing called artifact testing where you take a toothbrush or an old letter that somebody has licked and you send it off to a laboratory that processes it and extracts the DNA from the artifact. So you don't have uh, a saliva sample or a cheek swab from a living person, but you have a DNA trace of them. Some people have gone as far as exhuming a body from a grave and having testing. There are some uh, biopsy samples from medical tests that are preserved up to five or 10 years that can, if they can be found, the DNA can be extracted from them. So there are ways around the living. Um, there are ways of getting around that, but in some situations, the barrier is so high, whether it's just trying to see if there is any other DNA evidence or the cost is prohibitive of going that route. And um, there will never be a DNA connection. It will just come back to um, circumstantial evidence and ruling out all other possibilities. Okay, and now we have, uh, we have another question here. Can you address some of the issues um, that people with misattributed parentage experience. Yeah, so let me think of a case and so I have um, a client who has identified her biological father. She was not intending to find out that the dad who raised her was not biologically her father. So she found out late in life and all of the parents involved have already passed on. And she has matched to a niece and has been able to determine the, um, the man who is her father and there was a connection through other information that kind of confirmed the theory. And she has reached out and sent letters to all of the half siblings, four half siblings that she has, and has waited for two years and no response from any of the siblings. So she's at a decision point right now. Does she send a letter, a second letter to all of the siblings again or does she continue to wait? 
and so that is that that is her her decision point right now so as she's trying to make a decision part of her is not wanting to be rejected again with silence by sending a second letter so if she sends a second letter and that one also is not responded to um, the pain from that experience again she's avoiding so she's making that decision right now to not send the second letter out of a, a desire for non-maleficence she's also making the decision for herself to send a letter or not to send a letter so that brings in the principle of autonomy but all along she is wanting to be acknowledged and um that ties in to justice that being just being acknowledged is being treated with fairness and equity. So there are a couple of different principles that are coming into that decision around wanting to search or wanting to reach out again with a second letter, um, but not doing that yet. Yes, and I think it um, misattributed parented also, it can be a real shock to our sense of self essential questions about self and identity and also really what family is can you speak to that maybe we have probably one minute left before we wrap up yes so i think you hit the nail on the head when you mentioned identity and i think the difference for a person who makes a discovery later in life of misattributed parentage is that in a in a sense their identity has already formed to a point that um, finding out new information changes their identity and at a time that they weren't expecting it. And um, it's a, a different situation than somebody who has um, you know, known from a young age or can't remember finding out that their genetic parentage is not the parents who are raising them and um, that's been a part of their identity as they've grown up. So the, um, the loss of a sense of trust in um, like truthfulness, going back to the principle of truthfulness and uh, can undermine that feeling of stability that, that you take for granted. That's just a part of your identity and then having to rebuild that. Thank you. Hey, I just want to thank everyone that's joined us this evening. And thank you again, Brian, for sharing your wisdom and volunteering your time with us tonight. Um, as many of you know, Adoption Network Cleveland is a nonprofit organization serving individuals and families impacted by adoption, kinship, and foster care through support, education, and advocacy. And to find out more about our organization or to support our network, please visit our website at adoptionnetwork.org. We are a membership organization and we hope that you consider joining us as a member. And uh, join us next uh, for the next series on Monday, June 7th, when we host Damon Davis of the podcast, Who Am I Really? And keep your eye on our calendar as we add new offerings and Thanks everyone for being here tonight.